This is a lecture on the generation of reactive oxygen species, or ROS, from October 5th, 2020. And in this lecture, we're going to review some terms, um, as well as introduce some new ones, uh, such as reactive oxygen species and superoxide radical. We're going to go back and review the very basic process of aerobic respiration. And then we're going to talk about how ROS and reactive oxygen species are thought to relate to aging. And so in the 1950s, Harmon uh, proposed a theory known as the oxidative stress theory of aging. Um, and it was known at this time that aerobic respiration in the mitochondria generated what are called oxygen-centered free radicals, or what we now know as reactive oxygen species, which is an oxygen that has one or more unpaired electrons. And ROS, or the reactive oxygen species, were allowed to escape degradation in the cell and then damage biomolecules. And according to this theory, it was the accumulation of damaged biomolecules, like proteins, that was the main mechanism for aging. We now know that this is um, not the only mechanism by which aging occurs, but it is one of them. Um, and it is an important one. And so we're going to talk about how oxygen-centered free radicals or reactive oxygen species form within the cell to better understand this mechanism of aging. And so <laughs> before we start, I just wanted to review these two terms because I'm going to be using them a lot throughout the rest of the lecture. Um, and so when we refer to oxidation, what we're referring to is the loss of electrons. And in the case of these reactions that we're going to be discussing today, um, this loss of electrons comes in the form of a loss of an oxygen or the gain of a hydrogen. And reduction refers to a gain of electrons. And in this case, it would be the gain of an oxygen or loss of a hydrogen. Right, and so an easy way to remember which is which um, and whether oxidation or reduction is loss or gain of electrons is this um, mnemonic oil rig where oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain. And in general, oxidized compounds are more reactive and reduced ones are considered more stable. And that's why these um, reactive oxygen species or these oxidized compounds can actually exert some harmful effects in the cell. And so to begin, in order to start talking about ROS generation, we have to first talk about aerobic respiration, right? And so we're going to start sort of in the middle of it. Um, and before the Krebs or TCA cycle takes place, glucose is converted into um, pyruvate through glycolysis and then um, converted from pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and sort of the preparatory reactions. And that acetyl-CoA can enter into the what's known as the Krebs or TCA or citric acid cycle. The Krebs cycle takes place in the matrix or the center portion of the mitochondria and it's a series of eight different reactions. Um, and the oxidation of these molecules here in orange releases electrons right, because oxidation is loss. And so every oxidation reaction releases electrons. And those electrons have to go somewhere. And the place where they go is to reduce electron carriers, in particular NAD and FAD. So NAD plus is reduced to NADH plus H plus, and FAD is reduced to FADH2. And these electron carriers can then shuttle or bring electrons to the electron transport chain or electron transfer system in the next portion of aerobic respiration. And it's these electrons that really power the process of ATP synthesis in aerobic respiration. Right, and so as I said, reduced electron carriers like NADH and FADH2 We'll bring electrons to the next portion of, um, or the next phase of aerobic respiration, which is the electron transport system. And the Krebs cycle is occurring here, down in the matrix of the mitochondria, 
The electron transport system exists in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And it's a series of complexes, four complexes, as well as ATP synthase, that can um, receive electrons and transfer them from complex to complex. And so the reduced electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, are able to transfer those electrons, or become oxidized, to the complexes of the electron transfer system. And those electrons are passed from complex one to two to three to four, and ultimately used to reduce oxygen gas and form hydrogen or and form um, water molecules. And in the process, the energy re um, released from the transfer of electrons from complex to complex is used to pump hydrogen ions across the membrane. Because you can imagine if you're taking two hydrogens and then putting um, transferring the electrons from those to this complex, you still have leftover hydrogen um, atoms or protons. And those <coughs> are actually pumped across the membrane to create a gradient. And then that gradient of high hydrogen atom concentration in this intermembrane space and low hydrogen atom concentration inside the matrix creates a gradient. And that <coughs> those hydrogen atoms can actually move down their concentration gradient from the intermembrane space into the matrix of the mitochondria through a molecule called ATP synthase. And as they flow back into the matrix, they actually sort of work like water in a water wheel to power ATP synthase and um, generate ATP. <laughs> and so the important part in terms of Ross generation is this step right here where the electrons are actually used to reduce oxygen gas to water. And this is the three-step reaction, which you can see down here. Um, and this is just kind of due to the chemistry of oxygen that this reaction needs to happen in three steps. And first, one electron is added to the oxygen gas, or O2, to create a superoxide radical. And so you can see that O2 with one extra electron, which is the dot, and it now has a negative charge, because we know that electrons are negatively charged. Then a hydrogen atom is added to the superoxide radical to create hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide is still harmful to the cell, as are the superoxide radicals. <coughs> and so then in order to kind of eliminate this harmful hydrogen peroxide, a third reaction has to take place and two electrons must be added to hydrogen peroxide to ultimately form a water molecule. And this process is actually really, really efficient. And so some superoxide radicals, these guys here, can escape. But in terms of the amount of oxygen consumed within the cell and ultimately um, converted into water through respiration, only about 1% of those oxygen molecules actually generate a superoxide radical that can escape into the cell and do any damage. So this is done really, really efficiently, which is fortunate because both the superoxide radicals and hydrogen peroxide, as I said, are harmful to the cell. But unfortunately, when ATP synthesis is low or aerobic respiration is low, the reduction of oxygen to water becomes less efficient. And so in cases where there's a lot of ATP, in the matrix relative to ADP, there's no need for the electron transfer system to make ATP because there's enough around already, right? And so <coughs> when there's no need for more ATP, the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle is slowed down, shut down, which means no electrons are being, um, are reducing those electron carriers and being shuttled to the electron transfer system. And no ATP is being made. And when that ATP synthesis goes down, 
there's a low concentration of protons in the matrix. And that means that when NADH and FADH2 are not donating their electrons to this complex and leaving behind the hydrogen ions inside the matrix, there's nothing that can be used to re help reduce oxygen to water. There is no H for this, there's no H plus ions to make this reaction happen. And since water can't form and there's no H plus um, protons to reduce the superoxide radical, superoxides form at a much higher rate. Right, because this reaction can continue. There are still electrons and there's still oxygen gas, but there's no hydrogens to then move, convert um, superoxide radicals to hydrogen peroxide. And so without that, reduction to ultimately to O2 is less efficient and superoxide radical um, formation can increase when ATP synthesis is low. And in addition, um, one thing that actually makes the reduction of oxygen gas to water so efficient is that there are two enzymes involved in the process that help it along. And the first is involved in actually taking the superoxide radicals and hydrogen atoms and reducing superoxide radicals to hydrogen peroxide. That enzyme is known as superoxide dismutase or SOD. And once again, what it does is it takes a superoxide radical um, and reduces it to hydrogen peroxide. And you can see the structure of superoxide dismutase here. Um, SOD is actually mutated um, in the neurodegenerative disease, ALS. And the other enzyme that makes um, reduction of oxygen to water um, happen a little bit easier is catalase. And catalase is there to take hydrogen peroxide generated by SOD <clears throat> and then further reduce it to water and oxygen gas. And so you take hydrogen peroxide in, convert it to water and oxygen gas. And you can see the catalase enzyme here as well. And you have probably observed catalase before. Um, it's tend and they tend to use it in introductory biology labs. Um, yeast actually produce catalase. And so if you mix yeast, um, even the kind you have at home in your fridge to make bread with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide on a microscope slide, what you'll notice is that there's a ton of bubble formation. And that's actually the formation of this oxygen gas that you can measure, right? And so by having SOD and catalase involved in this process, um, one, it increases the efficiency of the re reduction of oxygen gas to water. And it also helps eliminate um, some of these ROS, these reactive oxygen species like superoxide radicals and hydrogen peroxide more quickly so that they can't do harm to the cell. And I keep referring to how they do harm to the cell. Um, and we're going to cover that and how ROS actually can affect um, membranes as well as other molecules in the next lecture.